Dr. Mario Ramos is Associate Professor of Biblical Theological Studies. Uh, he has been with BUA, I think BUA started in 1947. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Dr. Ramos has been with us way before we were accredited. He was a member of the Board of Trustees uh, that led to the accreditation of BUA, and then he joined the faculty, I think in 2002. Uh, so he was invited to be a member of our faculty body in 2002. Uh, Dr. Ramos is a graduate of University of Texas, uh, where he studied political science. And then he went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for his Master of Divinity degree. And then he has his Doctor of Ministry degree from Truett Seminary at Baylor University. He has pastored in different churches in Texas. He's from Laredo, from a very small family. Uh, am I correct? Yes. Uh, it's not even 100 people in his home household. <laughs> uh, and he has been a blessing to us. Uh, every student who has taken one of his courses, I mean, enjoys not only the passion with which he teaches, but the care that he places in the lives of the students. His office always, I mean, I have seen, I've been there many times, there's always somebody there with him. And he has lunch with students. He's, so is this, this person who takes a very, very special care for the lives of our students. Let's welcome Dr. Ramos as he brings the word of the Lord to us this morning. Thank you. God bless you. I thank uh, Dr. Rodriguez for, uh, for inviting me to come and preach, and I really do appreciate it. I consider this a great honor to come and speak to the faculty and staff, and especially the student body uh, at BUA. I'd like to uh, ask a question uh, about, uh, to introduce the, the topic is, what uh, kind of house did you grow up in? Uh, I'm not talking about whether it was a two-story or one-story or trailer. No, no, no. <laughs> what kind of home did you grow up in? Was there a home where uh, people had, there were a lot more laughing than crying? A lot more smiling than yelling? <laughs> where you felt good and you could say whatever you wanted? You had to walk like on eggshells? Because the kind of home you grow up in really uh, says a lot the kind of person you became. Um, I remember a friend of mine never wanted to be at his house. He wanted to come over to our house because there were so many kids to play with. Uh, and my mother's cooking is pretty good. Uh, when my father got home, the, the atmosphere of the house changed, and we had to be careful what to say, what not to say, and... It was almost a different home when he would come, when he would leave, everybody, you know, have more fun. Because, man, you, you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, watch out. Uh, and so, uh, and, and like, and so it's the responsibility of the leaders of the home to provide a positive atmosphere. When, well, like manner, uh, we live in two worlds. As Christians, we live in two worlds, or, or two homes, or in two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. God's home and man's home. And, and we kind of navigate between the two. And so, uh, in today's passage, I, uh, Paul describes what it means to live in God's home. And he celebrates the life that we have in Jesus Christ. So let's look at the passage. It's in Romans chapter uh, 5, verse 1. I'll be on the screen. And so uh, it begins with these words. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in our Father's world, our Father's home, we have peace with Him. In God's world, we have peace with Him. And so... Uh, I really appreciate what uh, Sergio said about 
We, we are created, we really are, why do we worship? And one of the reasons we worship is that we are created for worshiping. Uh, God has created it that way to have a relation with us, to love us, and for us to love him. But we make a choice early on in our lives that we're not going to worship him. We're going to worship something else. And so we are in rebellion towards God, and we're fighting him, and we're scared of him. I know growing up, I was scared of God. Uh, I grew up in a very religious but very superstitious household. Uh, We did things to make sure God would not hurt us. God would not send his his lightning and thunder and bad news upon us. We were scared of God. I know I was. And I would do everything I could to make sure God was not not mad at me. Uh, I would go to church every day. I would serve as a, I was raised Roman Catholic, I would serve as an altar boy for over 10 years. I went to Mass uh, Monday through Sunday, except on Saturdays, most weeks, for forever, growing up. Uh, I would pray feverishly. Uh, I would tithe. Uh, I did all these things, but I was afraid if I didn't do them, God will get me. Uh, but it's, but you can't live that way. Right. You can't live that way. And so early on, I decided to run and hide from God. And to, so by the time I was 17 years of age, I had just given up on God. I went to church because I was afraid of my parents as well as God. <laughs> uh, and so that was my life. I was in rebellion towards him. I didn't want anything to do with him because Why? bad news, until my brother came and told me about Jesus Christ. He had become a Christian. He, he asked me a very important question. Would you like to have a relationship with God who created the universe? And I laughed. He says, what are you laughing for? He says, why would God have anything to do with me? I'm nothing. I'm an ant. He can step on me anytime he wants. Oh, no, he loves you. Love you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. So he, he explained to me what it means to have a relationship with God, that we don't have to be afraid of him. We don't have to run from him. You don't have to hide from him anymore. And so I accepted Jesus Christ when I surrendered to him as Lord of my life. Uh, I had peace with God. I had peace. And that a promise is given to anyone. The reason, I love what St. Augustine said, that our hearts are restless till we find our rest in him. And that's true. That's true. And so the battle is over. This is a, this is, this is a real peace. A peace. Uh, in our house, my father showed up. There were no fights. We could be mad at each other as kids, and we're going to get you, but wait till dad leaves. <laughs> So my thought, my father thought there was peace at home. No, there wasn't peace. There was Pax Romana. That means there was peace under uh, oppression. And when he left, man, it was all out. So anyway, but this is a real peace, a peace that, uh, that starts in our hearts, that starts in God's heart that he gives to us. And really, this, this, this lays the, the foundation for having reconciliation with other people. That's a different sermon. But let's go on. Uh, 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 in the, in the, uh, verse 2, it says, the first part, uh, through whom we have attained our, in, uh, our introduction by grace, uh, by faith into this grace in which we stand. So in my Father's world, we live by grace. In, my, in our Father's world, we live by grace. By that, I mean is that he deals with us not on the basis of our sinfulness, but upon His love for us. Uh, Growing up, one of my mother's most favorite games was The Price is Right on TV. You all familiar with The Price is Right? Okay, well, good. Uh, I'm surprised. (laughs) The noise is going to know that one, but it's still on, I guess. Okay, so, um, so they try to guess how much things value. What's the price of this versus the price of that? Uh, I would lose every time if I went to that thing. Uh, 
But in a consumer society, from the time, even before we were born, we're born into a world where we are taught to give a value to everything. In a consumer society, you are bombarded every single day with thousands of offers, deals, and, you know, uh, you're watching TV, how many commercials come up, you're going down the highway, all these billboards at you, listen to the radio, all these commercials, you open up a magazine or a newspaper, all these ads, ah, too much, too much. Uh, and so, uh, so every day we're, we're saying, that good, no good, I don't want to hear it, no, it's, uh, email, it's delete, 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 you know, your phone, delete, 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 because they're making you all these offers and instantly, all day long, we're making choices to put a value on that, well, that maybe is a good deal. You know? and, so, uh, and so this is how we grow up in a consumer society. The sad thing is that we put value and put a price tag on people, too. The psych psychologists tell us that within 10 seconds, we, ch we, ch we, we, put a, we put a value on the person we meet, the way they talk, the way they carry themselves, the way they look. So, yeah, you know, we, we put a value on them. And that's not a good thing. That's not good. Because it's never quite how God sees them. And so growing up in a fallen world, we come to understand that we're, we're not enough. Apart from God, we grow up thinking, I'm not good enough. I'm not handsome enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not thin enough, I'm not fat enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not athletic enough, I'm just not enough. And we believe those lies. And those lies, we carry them for the rest of our lives. And it keeps them from being the people God called us to be. And it interrupts the way we, we relate to the world, relate to others, because we are defensive. We make promise to ourselves to protect ourselves like I won't trust anybody. Unless I know I'm going to succeed, I won't try to do this or whatever. So, we, so, so we, we're filled with all these lies. But yet God approaches us with his grace and does not treat us the way the world treats us. And I love that passage that uh, the scripture says, uh, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Isn't that wonderful? God, we, God put a, a price tag on you, and it's everything. Not only that, he sent his son to die on the cross for all our sins. He, he, that's how much of a value we are to him. I remember once, and I think it was one of the first BUA dinners I went to, when we were trying to do, well, the things that we have at the uh, Oaks, Oak Hills thing, uh, you have assigned, we had assigned seating. And, uh, and of course, you have to dress up really nice. So Linda, my wife and I went, and we dressed up as best we could. And uh, we were treated with ro like royalty. This is really nice. This beautiful place. Chandeliers, carpet, people smiling. Everybody's so polite, well-dressed. Made you feel special. And they said, well, Dr. Ramos, you're, you're on uh, table 13 or whatever. Said, oh. We walk in there, beautiful place. Round tables with white uh, cloths on them with a centerpiece of flowers, and then all the plates sparkling white and has, you know, all the silverware, real silver. The light is sparking off the crystal glasses, and everything is so beautiful. 
You're walking around, and you come to table 13, and there, in front of the, uh, next to the plate, is the name in, a, in beautiful script, Mario Ramos. I felt so special, you know, and my wife's name was there. You know, you just, you know, I, 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 you know, you just, you feel so wonderful inside. I must be special. Look at all the work these people did to provide a place for me and my wife to sit. I mean, this is nice. And so when I think about how much God loves us, I think about a dining room table where Jesus seated at the head table, of course. But off the side table, I imagine my name right there. That we all have a place around the table of Jesus Christ our Lord. So we don't have to live in fear. We don't really have to worry what other people think about us. We don't have to worry about being judged. We don't have to try to be perfect because we know we're enough. And so we don't have to live in fear. We can live in the Father's world in the comfort knowing that he loves us and all he wants us to do is try our best. And if we fail, he understands. Let's go on. In our Father's world... We live, uh, we have hope. That's verse 2b and, and the last part. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. Uh, there are two kinds of hope that the Bible talks about. There's a hope, well, let me explain it this way. Uh, think of a farmer, uh, and there's a drought in the land, and he needs rain badly. And so he walks out the front door, His fields are just dirt, dry, dusty. And he looks up in the sky, and all he sees are blue from horizon to horizon and buzzards flying overhead. He turns to his wife and says, man, I sure hope it rains today. Of course it doesn't rain. (laughs) Next day he comes out saying, farmer, Oh, okay, I I knew something was wrong. I don't know what. (laughs) Have you not heard me this whole time? I don't know. (laughs) Let me start at the beginning. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So the the same farmer walks out the same front door. He looks out at his ground, dry and dusty, but this time it looks up, and the clouds are thick and black and heavy with rain. He sees in a distance lightning flash, and he hears the thunder, and he smells the, the, the coming rain. He turns to his wife and says, man, I sure hope it rains today. Right. The first hope was an uncertain hope, a maybe hope. The second hope is a confident hope. That's what the Bible is talking about. That's the hope of the glory of God. We exult, we rejoice. Uh, the NIV says we boast, not in ourselves and God, we, in the hope of the glory of God. That we will, one day, we will be glorified. The Bible says that we will reign with Christ. I don't understand that. I I love the passage in Revelations where it says that uh, uh, we, uh, you have been made, uh, you have made then, speaking to Jesus, to be a kingdom and priest of our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Revelations 5.10. But who are these people who's talking about that? In verse 9 it says, those he purchased with his blood. 
We will reign with Christ. This is a confident hope. We know that when we die, we will be with him. Now, for you, young people, that's not a big deal. Because you think you're going to live forever. The other day, I had a near-death experience. Psychologists said we should all have near-death experience, but it helps us reevaluate our lives. You know what happened? I woke up, got out of bed, and I thought to myself, oh, no, today I turned 65. <laughs> A near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> near, <laughs> a near death experience. <laughs> so you're always asking, what's next? Right? I teach capstone this semester, and the students are graduating, and I'm asking them, what's next? They're asking me, well, what's next for you? <laughs> Ta-da! In the glory of God. That's what's next for me. <laughs> right? But it changes. It changes the way we live our lives knowing that this is not it, right? What can we take with us to glory, right? Nothing except people. People, that's what it's about. It's about living a life of love and service, leading people to Christ, drawing them up in Christ, helping them become better people, Serving people who are who find themselves in, in the chains of injustice and oppression. Well, it's a different sermon, but you know where I'm going. <laughs> and then lastly, in our Father's world, we experience tribulation. I'll be reading verses 3 through 5. And not only this, Paul says, we also exult, we also rejoice, we also boast in our tribulations. Let me stop there for a second. <laughs> what? <laughs> What does this word mean? It means suffering. It means trials. It means hard times. It means bad news. How can we rejoice or exult in our tribulations? He doesn't say for our tribulations. He says in our tribulations. Not not because for them, but for what it does for us. Let's continue reading. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulation, knowing that our tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance brings about proven character. And proven character brings about, it's not in there, I'm just putting them in there. Hope, hope again. And hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Now, the Bible doesn't make light of our suffering. I, unfortunately, have heard so many stories about our students and how much suffering you have endured. There are times when I just, there's nothing to say, just cry. It's really, it's, it's really amazing that you're even here. But it speaks of your spiritual, or, or your faithfulness to God. So Paul is not making light of our tribulations and trials and sufferings. But he says they're not wasted on you. They're not wasted. Sometimes our sufferings come of our own making, making some bad choices. Been there, done that. Uh, Sometimes suffering comes from other people's bad choices. And then sometimes suffering comes because we live in a fallen world where there's disease, natural disasters, drought, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, life. But God takes the tattered pieces of our lives and he makes something beautiful out of them. Uh, like, like a, how can I say this without sounding too melodramatic or flippant? There are ways that God cannot reach the depths of our soul that need to be healed 
other than through suffering. <coughs> suffering, when we're suffering, a couple of things may happen. One, we may run away from God and decide he, he, he's too scary. I did my part. What's wrong with you? You didn't do your part, God. They have a bargain God mentality. And that's not the Bible that the, the God the Bible speaks of. It's a loving God. Or if we allow God and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit give us the strength to, to persevere in our suffering, we'll discover how skillful God is. Like, like, like a skilled surgeon cutting away the diseased part of the patient to bring about healing. Or, or like a master potter who has the clay in his hand to shape the clay that best fits the, the service uh, that he wants. And so suffering for us makes it easier for us to pray. Suffering for us causes us to slow down, to let God work upon our souls in a mysterious and the only way that he can, that we would allow him to. Uh, I, I, I heard a statement my pastor made. He says, there's, there's far more to praying than for asking for things. And one of the things that we can do on a daily basis is just to in, sit there before God and be at peace with him. No words. Not even thoughts. Just enjoy his presence. Let him work upon your heart in that still, restful silence. He is doing a work that he cannot do otherwise. Okay. Suffering does that, but we can also do that on a daily basis as well. And so this brings about, this brings about um, proven character. We become more and more like Jesus. It is through suffering and through persevering in that that we have to make hard choices about how we're going to live our lives. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I would say if you live long enough, people have hurt you really bad and caused you a lot of suffering. But then Jesus says, well, if you want me to forgive your sins, you've got to forgive their sins too. How, how can we do that? Well, through perseverance. <laughs> and so we become more like him. I remember when I complained to God about forgiving someone who had really hurt me badly, his response was, well, now you know how I feel like when you sin against me. You want to be more like me? That's what it takes. Really? <laughs> right? But that's only one of many, many issues. So we become more compassionate, more kind, more loving, more forgiving, more accepting as we allow God to work upon our lives. And so, and so as a result of that, we have more hope than we had before the, the, the ride began. Because we see that, my goodness, I am changing. God must really be real. And my glory must be for sure. Uh, not only we have the Bible, the testimony of the prophets, we also uh, of the apostles, but we also have 2,000 years of church history. We know that this is real, but then to let, see it in our own lives, wow, the Bible does reflect what's happening in my heart. And so that gives me even greater hope than we had before. And so we live not in this world, but in the Father's world where life is to be lived. In today's climate, you, you can call your, as long as you have an enemy, you can treat him the way you want, you can call him names, you can uh, abuse him, and it's fine. That's the way things are. It's a doggy dog world. God doesn't call us to that. 
in God's world, in our Father's house, we treat everybody with civility, with dignity, with respect, because everybody's made in the image of God, even if we disagree with them, even if they're wrong, <laughs> or we think they're wrong. We treat them with kindness and compassion. After all, we could be wrong too. And so, we have a choice to make. What world do you want to live in? In the Father's world? Or in man's world? The choice is ours. Let us pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the life you have called us to. A life of love, of service, of kindness, compassion, of forgiveness, of joy, of life worth living. We choose you. Help us, Lord, along the way. In Christ's name we pray, amen.